Take your Bibles and go to uh, Luke chapter 4, please. <clears throat> We're going to talk about Jesus' temptation by the Satan. We have, um, if you remember, we talked a little bit in the last hour about, the, uh, about Isaiah 7.14. We briefly mentioned the fact that it talks about Jesus, his virgin birth, it talks about the child that, be, that he'll eat butter and honey before he knows to choose um, for, or resist the evil and to choose the good and, and so forth. It talks about him learning the difference between right and wrong and that he will always choose the good. <clears throat> in, um, we also, last time we talked about the fact, we looked at some passages in Luke that talk about the fact of Jesus growing in wisdom and understanding. We looked at his... Um, when he was 12 years old, when he went to the temple, and the, um, the leaders at the temple were shocked, the scholars were completely shocked at his wisdom and his understanding of the scriptures. And when his mother says to him, um, you know, hey, uh, Jesus, we, uh, we've been looking for you, your father and I, she says, your father and I have been searching for you. He says, um, didn't you know that I had to be about my father's business? Remember that? I had to be about my father's business, showing that God was his father, not Joseph. Joseph is his adopted father, yes, but God in heaven was his father. And Jesus was well aware at that time, at 12 years old, he was well aware of his mission on earth, and his father had been teaching him uh, all along the difference between right and wrong, teaching him all these things as he, we lead up to his Ministry. Now, we don't know anything about what Jesus did between being 12 years old and the time of his baptism at, um, in, um, when John the Baptist baptized him. But in, uh, let's go to Luke chapter 4. Uh, actually, go back to, um, go back to, 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 to. Um, we're trying to find Jesus' baptism in chapter 3. Um, well, verse 21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. Now, the rest of this chapter just gives Jesus genealogy through Mary, which we don't want to get into that. But skip down to chapter 4, verse 1, where he picks up the narrative again. Then Jesus, now notice this. Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. Underline that in your Bible. In fact, I'm going to underline it in mine right now. I didn't look in the Greek, but I would imagine it is. It might be a present tense verb, I'm not sure. But... Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, at his baptism, it says the Holy Spirit descended upon him visibly in the form of a dove. And now it says, Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan, that's where he was baptized, and was led, and notice this, by the Spirit, you can underline that as well, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. You know, the other Gospels, say he, he fasted in, in, for 40 days in the wilderness, and then the devil tempted him. It sounds like, it doesn't require, but it sounds like after fasting 40 days, and he had, you know, like 15 minutes of temptations or something, right? But Luke is a little more clear. He says Jesus was being tempted by the devil for 40 days straight. 40 whole days. That's a long time. And he fasted during that time. Why do you think Jesus fasted during that time? What's that? Fasting and prayer is important for us, isn't it? What, is it? what does it do for us? It puts down your flesh. Deny your person, your, your own desires and get you focused on what's really important. Kind of, uh, it's kind of like training before a fight, maybe. Right. He was preparing. Well... He was tempted by the devil for that whole 40 days. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. 
And the devil said to him, now we don't know all the temptations that Jesus went through during those 40 days. But it says he was tempted for 40 days. And then it said after the 40 days, and then it lists three temptations that Jesus was given by the devil. I, want you to, I just want you to let that settle in. I hadn't noticed this before. I thought Jesus had three temptations. It was, you know, wham, bam, bam, and it was over. No. Jesus was tempted for 40 days straight by the devil. The Gospels only tell us the three that he tempted him at the very end of the 40 days. It doesn't tell us all the temptations that he went through prior to that. But anyway, let's read what happened. He says, uh, verse 3, And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Now, let me ask you this. Was Jesus being tempted to sin? Was he just being tested in some way, or was he actually being tempted to sin? He's being tempted to sin. Fall down and worship Satan. Would that be sin? That's sort of like the ultimate sin, isn't it? I mean, the whole thing in Revelation about taking the mark of the beast and all that kind of stuff, that's what that is. That's worshiping the devil. Jesus is being tested here and tempted. This is sort of the epitome of his temptation, whether he would fall down and worship the devil. That's the ultimate idolatry. Jesus was being tempted to sin. And what did he do? Well, let me ask you this before we go there. Was Satan lying to him here? Was Satan able? Was, did Satan actually have this, this authority over all the kingdoms of the world that he could give to Christ in a moment? Yes. Why did Satan have that authority? Adam gave it. <laughs> Adam kind of gave up that authority, didn't he? Adam, when God created Adam, what did he say to Adam? He told him that he's given him all this to, to he said he wants him to rule over the fish in the air, uh, the, uh, fish, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. Yeah, the, the fish of the air. <laughs> you guys haven't seen flying fish? You guys never go fly fishing. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Adam was given, remember, um, in, in fact, Hebrews quotes a, a psalm, I forget the name of the chapter. It talks about what is man, that you are mindful of him, and the son of man, that you visited him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. You set him over the works of your hands. And then it goes on to say, after quoting that psalm, it goes on to talk about how that he left nothing that was not put under man. Man was given the, the authority and the dominion over all the creation, but Adam, what did he do? He just threw it all away when he sinned. And he lost that. And here Satan has that authority. And it was because of Satan, wasn't it? Satan's the guy who was the snake in the garden that tempted his wife and got him, basically wrenched all this away from him. And now he's saying to Christ, look, I have this authority now. I can give it to you. Now, why would that be a temptation to Jesus? Why would that be? Jesus knew. I mean, what does Psalm chapter 2 say? You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You'll shepherd them with a rod of iron. Right? He, God promised all that to his son. Jordan? It would be, be after his suffering. Yeah. Right, that's right. So Bypass path. the suffering to get to what the goal was. Right? An easy path. Jesus had a choice to make here. He had a choice to make here about whether he would take the easy path to the kingdom or he had the same choice, really, when we get to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane towards the end of his ministry where he's praying, and he says, Father, if it's possible, remember he's sweating great drops of blood and all that kind of stuff. If it is possible, take this cup away from me. If there's any other way that mankind can be saved without me having to go through all this, please 
Can we do it? But then he's, in the end, he says, nevertheless, not my will that yours be done. That was a real struggle. Jesus had the choice to make. The Father had, remember we read in John how the Father had turned all this, this authority over to the Son? The fate of all mankind, he gave it to the Son. And the Son had to choose whether or not he was going to go through and accomplish salvation so the human race could be saved or not. It was up to him to do that. Let's look at this passage again. The devil is tempting Jesus. He says, if you fall down and worship me, I'll give you all this that the Father promised you in Psalm chapter 2. I'll give it to you right now. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to die on a cross. You don't have to do any of that stuff. I'll give it to you. Deal with the devil. <laughs> you know what happens when you make a deal with the devil, right? He's got some fine friends, so. <laughs> so, verse 8, Then Jesus answered and said, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written. Now, look at this. <laughs> the devil's a quick learner, isn't he? I mean, Jesus answered the devil's temptation by quoting Scripture. And so Satan, he's going to tempt Jesus. He says, I'm going to quote some Scripture. <laughs> right? He quotes from Psalm 91. He will give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Well, that, he, he didn't misquote it. It's there. Verse 12, And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, was Jesus saying, I am the Lord your God and you can't tempt me? Is that what he was saying? Or was he saying, If I jump off the roof of the temple, I'm tempting God. I would be tempting God. That's what he's saying. Right? Jesus saying, I can't do that. I won't do that because the scripture forbids me from tempting God or testing God. And that would be a presumptuous act and it would be tempting God and therefore I can't do it. That was his answer. All right. Now, um, let's continue. Verse 13. Then the devil... Um, verse 13. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Oh. <laughs> oh, that wasn't actually the end of it all, was it? There was more to come. We don't hear much about more to come in the Gospels, but there was more to come. Yes, Jordan. The passion would be kind of at those end. Have you ever seen the passion the so Yes, I did. Yeah, there's scenes where you see like, the same thing in the background. In the garden. Struggles. Yeah, yeah. They kind of apply that. Yeah, they, that they probably did, yeah. I mean, there's nothing like that, this old yeah. snake in the garden of Gethsemane thing that's in that film, but um, I can see how they would have inferred it from these kinds of, of passages. Now, I want you to take your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 5. We've, um, actually, I just, I just quoted you some of this, <laughs> but we'll read it again because it's in my notes. Um, he has... Uh, he has not put the world to come of which we speak, that is the kingdom, in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place saying, this is from Psalm 8, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands, and have put all things in subjection under his feet. That's the end of the quote from Psalm 8. For in that he put all in subjection under him, that is under Adam, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. And note the word yet. What does that imply? It will be in the future. There's a day coming when all things will be under the dominion of man. Verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. What does that mean? He became flesh. He was human. He, he, he became like we are. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. And it tells us why. For the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor. That is, we see him crowned with glory and honor now. That he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things. That is, everything is created for him. It's his inheritance. And by whom are all things. That is, he's the creator. 
in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings or complete through sufferings. Is, was Jesus immutable? How then could he be made complete if he was? For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. And what that means is they're all the same. He who sanctifies, that is Christ, and us who are being sanctified are all the same. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them, that is us, brethren. We are Jesus' brothers. Saying, quote, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. That's from Psalm 22. 22. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, quoting from Isaiah 8. Here I am and the children whom God has given me. That's the children of God that were given to Christ, if you read that passage in its context. Verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, and you really ought to underline all things there, it's important. In all things, he had to be made like his brethren. We were talking about Jesus being that example for us to follow. That's part of it. In all things, he had to become what we are. That, or so that, he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Now, before we move on here, later in chapter, I believe it's 7, I could be wrong, but he's talking about Christ's role now as a high priest. And he talks about the fact that priests were taken from among men in the Old Testament. They were men who had the same frailties as the rest of the people. That those were the people who qualified to be priests in the Old Testament. And he's saying the same thing of Christ here. Saying that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And notice verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted he is able to aid those who are tempted. He himself suffered being tempted. Now, flip over to, to chapter 4 of Hebrews. Verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. The Greek literally says tempted just like us. Just like us. According to our temptations. Just like us. Those who say, well, Jesus was, so just went through the motions of being tempted, but he could not it was impossible for him to sin because of his divine nature or something like that. They're not telling you what the truth. They're not telling you what the Bible says. It says that Jesus was tempted in all points like we are, like we are, exactly as we are. That's exactly what the passage means, exactly as we are. Now, he was tempted, which means he had the choice. He could make the choice. Why didn't he sin? Was it because of his inherent nature? No, it wasn't because of his inherent nature. He became just like us. Why didn't he sin? It clearly says he didn't sin here, right? Look what it says. Um, where was it? Verse, um, okay. But was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. He, he suffered the same temptations with the same possibility to choose sin, but he did not choose sin. Remember what, remember what Isaiah 7, 14, 15, 16 said again? The father, he's teaching him from a little infant. He's teaching him the difference between right and wrong, to choose the good and to refuse the evil. That's what Isaiah said. Yes? There's a point where Christ explains, I forget which uh, gospel, but the Pharisees says, well, aren't you born in sin? You know, these are from adult or whatever. He says, no, you know, I'm from my father. I do my father's will. You're from your mm -hmm. father, the devil, who's, who sins. 
he kind of explains that he does the Father's will and he doesn't sin because he's from his Father, God. You know, he's from a, you know, the eternal Father. Therefore, he's, he's following his will. So, he's follow, but he's choosing to follow the Father's will. That's the point I'm trying to make. See, this is a choice that Jesus is making. He's choosing. He has before him a path that can go this way or that way. And the Father is teaching him and guiding him and strengthening him and leading him along the right path. And when we get to the temptation with Satan, this was the ultimate pounding that Jesus took right here. It was the ultimate pounding. You are not going to be tempted in your life any more severely than Jesus was by the devil. All right? You will not. It's the epitome of a pounding from the devil, and Jesus overcame that, which ultimately gives you hope that with the power of God, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you can overcome every single temptation that's out there. Yes, Walter. Right. He gives us opportunities to escape. He gives us a way of escape. I want you to turn in your Bible to James chapter 1, please. <clears throat> Verse 13. But no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Why can't God be tempted by evil? Why is it impossible for God to sin? What is sin? Okay, I'm looking for a little bit more than that. <laughs> You're right. This, it is anything that is contrary to God's nature. It is missing the mark. And the, what is the mark? What is the mark that we keep missing? God's own nature. What God is, right? God defines what is good and what is evil. It's his nature that is the difference between everything that is in agreement with God's character and God's nature is good and everything else is missing the mark, is sin. This is what the Bible teaches. And what he's saying here is, God, because his nature is holiness, he cannot act contrary to his nature. The scripture says that God, who cannot lie, when it's in Hebrews 6, talking about the promise that he made to Abraham, he cannot lie. Can God do anything? No. no. He cannot lie. He cannot sin. This passage says he cannot be tempted to sin. He cannot. Was Jesus tempted to sin? What does that mean? It means he had to set something aside in order to be man, in order to fulfill what we are. He had to do that. Yes, Jordan? I think James was making a, uh, a little distinction here, though. It says in verse um, 14, mm -hmm. but each one is Mm -hmm. We don't see Christ being drawn away from his father's desires at any point in the gospel. He's all in, in Christ and doing evil. So the, it seems like the temptation James is speaking here is a little more severe than just like a test that Christ went through. No, what James, what James is talking about is the process that goes from temptation to falling into sin. If he continues to talk about it in the next verses, he says, um, well, let's look at verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires... And entice. Now, enticement comes after temptation. Temptation is simply evaluating whether or not you want to do this. Okay, that's an evaluation process. Then, and that comes from desires. Did Jesus have the desire to have the kingdom? Yes, yes he, his father promised it to him. And that's why Satan was playing on that desire when he tempted him. And, but what, what happens is when we allow, as a man, if we allow that desire to get out of control with this temptation, he says, um, 
he is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire, that is, his desire leads him too far, and then he is enticed. And what is enticement? I got to have that, right? I got to have that. Then when, des- it's sort of covetousness, really. And then when desire has conceived, that is, there's, there's this process, um, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So what James is, the point James is making here is that, number one, God and God's nature cannot sin, cannot be tempted, cannot sin. Man, on the other hand, humanity, here's how man falls into sin. Right? He has certain desires, and these desires get in, out of hand, and they entice him, and then it leads to committing the act, and then the act, sin, leads to death, ultimately. But when he says God, can, God is, um, where was it, verse um, 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. And then he makes a blanket universal statement of truth. And that is, God cannot be tempted and he does not tempt. That is, he does not tempt to sin. Now, does God test us? See, the word tempted is used in different ways in the Bible. Sometimes the word is referring to simply passing a test. Does God test us sometimes? Yes, it uses, it uses that term in that way uh, quite a few times in the Bible. But in this context, he's talking about tempted to sin, to, to choose sin or not. And in that context, he's saying God cannot be tempted, and God does not tempt anyone to sin. Yes, Jordan? Yeah, Well, it's, temptation doesn't start with you want to do evil. Temptation starts with simply a desire for something. But see, desires are not in, inherently evil. Just, in fact, in our Friday night Bible study, we were talking about um, you know, attraction to a, a woman. A young man is attracted to a young woman. God built that into us. He built that into us because he wants us to find a wife and, pro, and procreate and, and you know, propagate the human race. There's nothing wrong with that attraction but that attraction can go beyond certain limits, right? And become sinful because now it's becoming contrary to what God has established and what God has said. But the, the point, uh, Jordan, is that in, back in uh, the temptations that Jesus went through, it clear, it's clearly says that he was being tempted by the devil and the temptations that the devil gave him were clearly sinful things. There's no doubt about that. So, no. Christ desired it. See, the word lust is something that, we, that is kind of confusing too because the word lust in the Bible simply means a desire. All right, we have a, a negative connotation towards it. But desire in itself is not evil. It's when that desire begins to exceed the boundaries that God has uh, uh, put us in. Then it becomes evil. All right? So I I hope I can explain that. All right, Um, let me just finish this up because I'm almost out of time. Um, Actually, we'll just we'll just stop right there because the kids are coming in. All right. The thing I want you to take away from this is that Jesus really, really was tempted. He was tempted in all points, exactly like. We are tempted, yet without sin. What that means is he chose not to sin of his own free will. Having the possibility of sin, he chose what was right. Which is exactly what Isaiah 7, 14, 15, 16 says, that he will choose the good. But it's his choice. Can you choose the good when you're tempted to sin? Can you look to Jesus as the example of how to defeat sin? You can, because he became what we are, and he went through what we go through so that he could defeat it, and we could have an example. Listen, the temptation of Jesus, all, all four of the Gospels talk about the temptation of Jesus. It's not there just as filler material, although that's how many Christians t- uh, treat Jesus' temptation. They treat his baptism 
and his temptation as just sort of little incidental things that happened in his life, but they're not really important to his mission on earth and what he came to do. I'm telling you, they're extremely important to what he came to do. That temptation was the test for Jesus that qualified him to go on and do the things that he did, but he had to be beaten up by the devil and overcome. He overcame the devil by the power of the Holy Spirit that was upon him. That's what Luke says. And you can overcome the devil in exactly the same way. That's what the Bible teaches. So don't give me this stuff about, you know, well, you know, it's all grace and God, you know, he's going to sanctify me someday, but, you know, for now it's all just grace, grace, grace and all that kind of stuff. Yes, we do have grace for now because God knows that we're dust, as the scripture says. But he doesn't want us to stay that way, right? He wants us to struggle with the devil and defeat the devil in our life just like Jesus did. And he will give us the power to do that just as he did Jesus as well. Let's pray.